And now part two of Paul Revere and the Raiders, here on Pop Goes the 60s. Paul Revere and the Raiders ended 1967 in embarrassing fashion with the ill-conceived Christmas album, which brought an end to the collaboration with Terry Melcher. Not only that, but uh, they lost their TV show where the action is was canceled, and the classic lineup was broken up. Phil Volk, Drake Levin, and Mike Smith left the band, and that left the ownership in the hands of Paul Revere and Mark Lindsay, and they split the business up pretty evenly where Mark Lindsay handled the music production and songwriting and material, and Paul Revere handled the image and the live shows. Now the next single were two leftovers from Melcher's association with the band. Now, while Paul Revere and Mark Lindsay were getting their new band together, another project came up in the middle of all this, and this was the album Going to Memphis. Now, this is essentially a Mark Lindsay solo album. None of the other Raiders appear on this record. It was produced by Chips Moman. He insisted on his own players being on here. This doesn't really sound anything like the band. It was Mark Lindsay trying an entirely new direction to capture the Memphis sound. Well, I woke up in the night and I fumbled for the glass. When I turned it on and rubbed my sleepy eyes. Not only did he not capture the Memphis sound, Mark Lindsay is singing over the top and to the point he's trying to convince us all that he has soul. And he's, he does it with very poor material that doesn't fit his style at all. Have you ever loved and lost? I call somebody led you down the wrong road. Well, I have, but I don't want it. That's why I don't want nobody. The album started charting lower and lower. This started at number 61. Fans were not fooled. Those songs were both moderate hits, and it gave you an idea of what was to come on the next album, Something Happening. Now, the TV show that they were doing at this time was a new show called Happening 68, another Dick Clark production. And this album and TV show was kind of a fresh start. You got the new players on here, and they ditched the colonial garb. They wanted to update their image a little bit, and unfortunately, the image is very glitzy and shiny, like on the, the back cover, the color photo shows them in this kind of shark skin pink suits that was all sparkly and not really what was going on in 68 in the counterculture at least. But the photographs here on the front and back describe the music on the record. Now, I'm sure many of you love this album. I don't like this one much at all. This album was entirely composed by Mark Lindsay, and the loss of Terry Melcher is more than evident. He was a very good songwriter, and Mark Lindsay, writing all this material, tried to make up for the loss of Melcher by going overboard on the production. So it sounds like a lot of gimmicky, psychedelic tricks are being used in this record, and it's just very overproduced. Happening was the theme song to the TV show, and that song is one of the grittier songs on this album. But overall, the loss of Volk, Levin, and Smith really shows that they lost their edge. Those guys gave the whole band a deeper feel, and having the studio musicians sub for them just doesn't cut it. This album charted at number 122, which was a very poor showing for Columbia's biggest selling band. And I can't help but think that the prior two albums really helped sour the fans. They had some work to do to, to reverse this trend. While Paul Revere and the Raiders are trying to get their act together, 
Smith, Volk, and Levin formed a band called Brotherhood. Now joining them is Ron Collins on organ, and they wanted to go in a more progressive, psychedelic direction than they had been going with the Raiders. This is a pretty credible album, and unfortunately, when they left Paul Revere and the Raiders, they wanted there to be a more democratic approach, and that wasn't happening. And for that, them to get out of the Raiders' contract, they had to give up a lot of their rights. So they were basically in on the ground floor of the Raiders' name. They had to sell that out to be released from Columbia, because they were not able to sign with another label until that was all worked out. So there was a lawsuit and it got a little bit ugly, as these things do, but that halted proceedings on the recording of this record. So this came out in 1968, which was later than they wanted to, but they had to deal with all the issues with Columbia and being released from that contract. In the meantime, they released a second album called Brotherhood, Brotherhood. Now, when I listen to both of these albums, I can't help but think what would have it been like had they stayed with the Raiders and gotten that democratic approach could they have gotten more into a, an FM radio type of band? Uh, maybe yes, maybe no, but they probably wouldn't have been so bubblegummy as they did on this last Raiders album, Something Happening. Revolution feels our weary way You know that every day should be a pleasure On the earth, this earth And it's true I'm good The problem with having this kind of control and doing exactly what you want to do is sometimes it doesn't go very well. Sometimes you're given enough rope enough to hang yourself with. The other album they did was called Joyride. They didn't go under the name Brotherhood on this record. It was They had some other friends, but this is more of a, an experimental album and uh, they were trying to be psychedelic, but it doesn't really work. So this album is rather aimless and self-indulgent, and I would say it's better left unlistened to. And by this time it was 1969, and back in the Raiders camp it was Sink or Swim. So they started working on their next album called Hard and Heavy with Marshmallow. Now that's, that title kind of describes them. They're trying to be hard and heavy, but the with marshmallows are trying to do it for a pop audience. So this is where they're kind of going running amok here and not able to really pick one direction or the other. It ends up being a compromise, and they turned out to be an AM radio band. With this album, there was a big change, and that was the replacement of Charlie Coe with Keith Allison. Now, Keith Allison was a member of the TV show Where the Action Is, and was a teen heartthrob and singer, and he toured with the Raiders when the, all the groups from the Action Show would tour together, so they knew him very well, and having him join on bass was the logical replacement. Now on this album, it features all original material, and here are the two singles. So some of the single mixes are mixed differently than the album versions, and they're doing that for maximum hit potential. They started doing that on some of their singles. Although the band does play on this whole album, they brought in a couple different session players to help them out. Guys like Ry Cooter, James Burton, and Glenn Harden. The song Trisha Lana is a favorite of mine from this album, and it's another great ballad that Mark Lindsay delivers beautifully. 
And I think he misses his calling in some of these singles because trying to maintain that, that rock voice and that harder rock approach on a very poppy song doesn't always mix well. But when he does the ballads, sometimes it just really hits and that's one of the ones that does. There are four or five pretty lousy songs on here that you have to kind of get through. And those will try your patience, but overall it sounds like a more honest album than the last one. And again, the band is playing most of all the instruments on here. Now one of the things I also like to point out is that this album came in two different covers. And I'm not sure why, I think this one was maybe from a reissue in the early 70s. But as you can see, they used the back photo on the original album for this. And kind of swapped the photos for some strange reason. But if you're seeing these in record bins, they are the same album. You know, retrospectively, the band members talk about this time as trying to find their way and maybe be a little bit more hard sounding, but they always took steps that were extremely commercial and lightweight. In this next example, they did a really excellent song for a commercial of the GTO Judge, the, the great sports car. This call has been called in session to pass judgment on a special new car from Pontiac. All rise for the judge. Just the special great one from GTO. For a band wanting to be taken seriously, uh, as good as the song is, I mean, they put on the old colonial outfits again, and so I don't really know how they're going to be taken seriously if they keep playing to the younger kids. That particular record was a promotional giveaway at the dealers, and it's a very highly sought after collectible. Now on their next album, the lead-off single was their hardest rocking single since Just Like Me. So Let Me, yeah, it's pretty repetitive, but it was a sizable hit here in the States and even bigger in Europe, so that allowed them to tour over there. Now this album is named Alias Pink Puzz, and the reason for the strange title is that they delivered this album to DJs to try to trick them into thinking this is a new band and that it wasn't Paul Revere and the Raiders. And the name of the band was Pink Puzz. Well, nobody was fooled because it sounds like an AM radio band anyway. So they just kind of kept that as the title for this album. And the only single from it was, released was Let Me. And, but it does have a few good songs on it. And each one looking hungry in her eyes. Written entirely by Mark Lindsay and Keith Ellison, this is probably their best album song for song since Revolution. Now, although they were viewed as an AM radio band, at least they were having hits, because by 1969, the Monkees, the Association, the Dave Clark Five, none of those groups were having hits anymore because of the changeover in the music styles and the FM format. I just happened to pull out uh, a little insert here in, the, in this album. It says, join the fan club, you know, get an eight by 10 membership certificate, biography of the group, etc. glossy photos. This is stuff that the counterculture bands and the cool bands were not doing so if they wanted to escape that image they were going about it all wrong. I had mentioned the classic lineup earlier and this version of the band doesn't get a lot of respect and they really should because Keith Allison did a lot of songwriting. Freddie Weller was a noted session guitar player and he was a songwriter in his own right. He wrote songs with Tommy Rowe, he wrote the big hit Dizzy and Jam Up Jelly Tight. He had a big country hit called The Games People Play. Oh, the games people play it now, every night and every day now, never meaning what they say now. Mark Lindsay was also carving a popular solo career all for himself with several hit singles from 1969. The Mark Lindsay solo material was pretty bland stuff, but it didn't keep them from charting well but that may have given the band the opportunity to 
play cute on the Mark Lindsay solo stuff, but take the band to a more serious rock direction. So the first thing the band did was they changed the name. They got rid of the Paul Revere and the Raiders featuring Mark Lindsay. They shortened all that to just the Raiders, which made total sense. Probably should have done it a couple years earlier. And they did this album called Collage. And the first single from this period was the topical song, We Gotta All Get Together. And Okay, We Gotta All Get Together is not a Woodstock anthem, but you know, it was trendy at the time to sing about those kind of themes. Despite that song, I mean, this album is a legit rock album, and I think this is maybe their best album. There are a couple low spots in here, but the high marks really make up for it. But you Gone Moving On was a remake of the song that they had recorded on the Revolution album. And Just 17 is a great example of the rock direction they were going in. Sorceress with Blue Eyes is one of Mark Lindsay's most convincing rock songs. It was co-written by Keith Allison and one of their forays into late 60s psychedelia. Now the darkness of the night time is replaced by morning's colors in my Monday's Now again, we see Mark Lindsay doing great justice to a couple of these ballads. And the softer songs really fit in with that singer-songwriter direction that the industry was in at the time. And um, despite very good reviews on this album, it only got to number 154. It's a legitimate rock album, but it's not Zeppelin II. For the Raiders, it, it's a bit of a surprise, and a pleasant surprise at that. I guess it's fair to say album-oriented rock was not in the cards for this band. So predictably, they released a Greatest Hits Volume 2 album. And this is really an excellent compilation. I got this one, I was rather young, I didn't have any of these later period albums. And if you want to bypass that and start with this, this has all the hits from late 67 up to 1970. And it's got a really fine track listing. You can't really go wrong, so I highly recommend this one. Now, this album did get into the charts just by the hair of its chinny chin chin. Looking back, this might have been the end of the band with an album charting as low as the previous one did. Release of Greatest Hits Volume 2. Maybe this is where the band ends, but they had one more trick up their sleeve. Now, the song that changed the band's fortune was Indian Reservation. Now, this was an older song written by John D. Laudermilk in 1959. It was a hit for Don Farden in 1968. And that same single by Farden charted in England in 1970. So the Raiders went into the studio to record this song in late 1970, and it slowly became a hit. Cherokee people, Cherokee now when I say the song slowly became a hit, part of the reason that was is because Paul Revere, in an effort to help promote the record, distributed 45s of the song to all these DJs across the country. He went on a motorcycle ride and really worked the song. It became the biggest hit of the band's career and their only number one. Another good thing that happened during this time is Mike Smitty Smith rejoined the band on drums and the band ran into the studio to record an album. I'm so far from my home, I feel lost and all alone. Whoa. So dark in this place, I can't even... 
So this is the album, uh, predictably titled Indian Reservation. And this song has a couple of pleasant songs on it, but unfortunately has some really bad covers like The Shapes of Things to Come and Eva Destruction. Now they were able to muster another quality single with the song Birds of a Feather. The windfall of a number one song made them an in-demand band again. They went to record a follow-up to this album called Country Wine in 1972. The album didn't do too well, but the next single, which was a Jimmy Webb song, was bound to hit. Song Seller is one of my favorite singles that they ever did, and I just love Jim Webb. And uh, it's too bad this song didn't hit because it's about a, a, the story of a band trying to get the record played on radio. So it's appropriate. So they did that song, and um, the songs after that also bombed. Love Music hit 97, and then they even did a Dylan song, which didn't even chart. Now The failure of these singles caused the follow-up album to be canceled. So that pretty much brought the band to the end of the recording career, the proper recording career. And the next stop was a stop in Vegas. They were the first rock band to play Vegas. And they, guess what? They donned their old uniforms again. So they basically became, I guess, a nostalgia act at this point. And it didn't last very long. Mark Lindsay left, all the band members kind of fell off. And then eventually the band was left to Paul Revere to carry on as an oldies act. If you're looking for some vinyl, if you want to get started with Paul Revere and the Raiders, I would suggest starting with these two greatest hits albums. It covers all the essential hits. If you are interested in the album tracks I played, their albums are fairly easy to find. They sold a lot of them, so it's not like they're scarce. One of the CDs that I bought, this is a two CD set called The Legend of Paul Revere. This has all their singles you know, over 50 songs on here. So this is a pretty good compilation. The other thing I want to mention, Quentin Tarantino's Once Upon a Time in Hollywood from 2019 uses several Paul Revere and the Raiders songs, namely Hungry, Good Thing, Mr. Sun, Mr. Moon, Kicks, It's Happening. They've been brought back a little bit in recent times. So one of the things, I mean, if there's anything to get out of the story of Paul Revere and the Raiders, in this day and age, they're not they don't get the respect they probably deserve, but there are a few bands who did AM pop radio better than them, and nobody did it longer. So you gotta give them some props for having the tenacity to weather the storm and continue to have hits over a 10 year period. So there you have the full ride of Paul Revere and the Raiders. Thanks so much for watching. As always, I have plenty of other bands coming. I've been listening to your suggestions. This is one of the bigger suggestions I've had, and I'm glad to cross this one off my list. This is a very fun group to do, and I had a lot of fun digging into their album tracks, and uh, I discovered a couple of new ones that I, I kind of have overlooked in the past. So I thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe, don't forget to share, and we'll see you next time here on Pop Goes the 60s.